I'm hoping the Big Ten has to modify their system for us. <laughs> it's probably like getting great 10 sandpaper rubbed on your face every day. I mean, we say it all the time, whether, you know, there's two types of turds, you're a sinker or you're a floater, but you're still a turd, right? I mean, um, we're, we're, we are about players and players playing the plays and not necessarily the plays. Welcome to the Varsity Club Podcast. My name is Derek Peterson. Joining me this week, we have a gaggle of your favorite Hale Varsity voices. Brandon Vogel is joining me, editor, fan of uh, Appalachian State gear and uh, curator of Cool Hats. Brandon, how are you? I'm doing well, thank you. How are you? I am well. Greg Smith is also with us. Uh, he, he took a second out of his day uh, filled with just misery over what has happened to the Chicago Bears quarterback situation to <laughs> join the podcast and talk to us about Nebraska's quarterback situation of the last 20 years. Greg Smith, how are you? I was doing very well until I was reminded of that Bears situation again. So uh, thanks for that. But I'm, I'm well otherwise. Well, I keep sending you um, tweets of, of people just taking their pot shots at the Bears. And the latest one was so good. I left. I, I almost like snot water out of my nose when I read it. It's OK. There's been a lot. I've seen a lot of them. I've seen them all. I feel like it's really good. Um, Aaron Sorensen is also joining us. Aaron, how are you? I'm good. And. Honestly, for the first part of this, like as you started, like everything in my life was very quiet. And then since you asked me, my computer has started to sound like an airplane and Scout has brought a squeaky toy into where I'm sitting. So that is just a matter of time. So I'm doing well, but I'm just hanging by a thread at the moment. <laughs> I'm so sorry, Aaron. I was going to ask you another question, but a tweet just came across my timeline. That oh, said, no. Uh, it's a quote from Andy Dalton that said, they told me I was the starter. And I just my heart sinks for you, Greg. Oh, I'm no. so sorry. <laughs> um, uh, I, uh, okay <laughs> Aaron is uh one of two hosts of the mind your own podcast uh we also have the other host who is producing for us today Sasha Durkin shouts to Sasha listen to their podcast Greg is the Robin to Jay Foreman's Batman on the straight up breakdown podcast and Brandon is <laughs> laughing because I made a comic book reference even though he hates comic books because he does not like fun Brandon is also the host of the i80 preview podcast which will return in the fall um lots of podcasts that you can subscribe to uh leave ratings and reviews for um we are a proud part of the herd at media network the hail varsity network lots of words uh that i tend to screw up uh, at the end of every podcast so i thought i'd get it out now subscribe to all of them read hailvarsity.com we appreciate you guys if i could talk properly we are here today to talk about the thing that we've been doing for the last week on hailvarsity.com which is the quarterback bracket um we uh, we decided to make a bracket. It's March. This is what this is what media companies do. This is what people do. Um, before we get to that, my first question for you guys: What's the best use of a bracket for a non basketball related topic uh, that you have ever made, participated in, um, or uh, looked at and enjoyed? Brandon, we'll start with you. My favorite bracket is um, often overlooked but it is the FCS football bracket. I don't know if anybody's ever suggested this before, but I seriously think that FBS football should look at, should look at doing that. It's just nice to see football teams laid out in a bracket where you know at the end of it who will have won. Um, so yeah, that's my, that's my suggestion. It was kind of tough to narrow down. There's a, as bracket making has become its own sort of cottage industry, uh, there, there were a lot to choose from. So I'm sticking pretty uh, pure, I guess, with FCS football. They do it right. I mean, we have a four-team bracket at the FBS level. Is that not good enough? No, it's not good enough because, like, six-year-olds in the backyard understand a four-team bracket. It's like, I'm going to play you, and she's going to play him, and whoever wins will play each other. Like, I don't look at the bracket and say, oh, Alabama beat beat uh, Oklahoma, who do they got next? 14 brac brackets are worthless. Although I guess you could do it for effect. Like maybe next March we'll release a two-team bracket, a Nebraska uniform bracket, and it will just be the championship matchup. It'll be home reds versus away whites, and that's it. That would be kind of fun. If the home reds have red pants, then they win. No, that's the point. We're only releasing two. Red pants got beat in the first round. Brandon took uh, sports. Greg, favorite uh, non-basketball related bracket that you have ever made, participated in, or seen? 
Man, this was, this was tough, um, but I, I'm actually going to go TV, um, specifically uh, HBO shows, um, because I feel like the, I saw this and I don't, I can't remember which company did it or how long ago this was, it was a couple of years ago, um, but there was one that I saw that was basically all of the HBO shows ranked, um, and I thought that that was extremely difficult to try and figure out what was going to be the winner, because I listed out just kind of some of like a handful of my favorites. Um, from HBO's like The Wire, Big Love, True Blood, Boardwalk Empire, Game of Thrones um, are probably off the top of my head my favorite ones from them, but there are so many. Like there are all sorts of shows um, that you could put onto that bracket. It is impossible to actually narrow down um, to a final four, much less pick an actual winner for that. Did you ever get to a winner? Who would? I don't remember what won. I feel like, I feel like The Sopranos won which is actually not like in my top tier of those shows. Um, I would have picked True Blood personally, because um, that was just great, even though it goes a little sideways towards the end, but most of these shows do. Um, but True Blood would have been my winner. Wasn't True Blood when uh, everybody was fascinated with, um, was it vampires in yes. media? Yeah, yeah. okay. Um, Aaron, favorite uh, non-basketball related bracket that you have seen made taken part in brandon has sports greg has tv you have to go a different route perfect because i'm going to take the uh omaha pizza bracket by sarah baker hansen that is happening right now all of it designed by hill varsity's own quentin uh which is not the reason i picked it it's actually a really cool uh idea it was supposed to happen around this time one year ago but covid19 delayed everything a bit so one year later the bracket is in motion you can vote right now at her website and there are some pretty close matchups uh and it's making me really want pizza in fact i was just looking at it and all of the votes, but again, you can, anyone can join right now at sarahbakerhanson.com. Uh, so if you're in Omaha or even if you don't live in Omaha, but you have an affinity for uh, Omaha based pizza, you're welcome to vote, but it's, it's really well done. It's just looks really nice. And she used to do food prowls when she was with the Omaha world Herald. And I miss those. So this kind of feels like the next natural progression of those food prowls where instead of like going out and trying all of these things in one moment, you open up to fans. And I mean, I think like I'm looking at it, there's 64 different pizzas. So it is not a small bracket by any means. Like this is, this is serious. It's serious business and it's well done. Two thoughts. Um, if journalism doesn't work out, have you ever considered a career in marketing? It's great because I technically have a degree in advertising. So there's, yep. there's probably a reason this works out for me is I'm really good at selling things, except for I'm a terrible salesperson. Can't ask people for money, but I can sure sell the heck out of something. So I, I have all of the like positives about selling without actually being able to make money off of it. So <laughs> the worst part of selling. Um, yep. Second, are there actually like 64 decent pizza places in the state? I don't. I don't like thin crust pizza and I don't, I don't, I feel like I'm in the worst place for that. Uh, I mean, I'm like going through the list right now and there's a lot that I, I really like. There's actually one that this is like a really tough matchup is like Noli's, which is so Noli's and Johnny Rico's and both of them are like New York style pizza. So, um, but yeah, I mean, there's some on here where like Godfather's is going up against somebody who's more local. So yeah, there's, you know, you're going to have to stretch a little bit to find, pizza but the one thing about nebraska is nebraska has a lot of has a lot of restaurants so it isn't surprising that there were 64 different pizza options that could go on this list and feel pretty good about it so i mean i'm even just looking through them again and it's incredible this was just really well done i can't wait and like for the record the best part of this is how into the how into it the restaurants are that's the other part is like the restaurants are really into it. And I know there's like a bracket happening in Lincoln too with different restaurants and everything. So it's nice when you can kind of build some like good momentum and especially right now more than ever, like give people some exposure that maybe need it, especially after the last year. But yeah, I'm not surprised that Nebraska has exactly 1 million different pizza options because they have that many like <laughs> hamburger options and you name it they're all there <laughs> you guys will laugh because of the conversation that we had off pod before we 
began this, but the uh, the bracket that I came armed with was a superhero movies bracket. Um, so there's there's that thing. Um, Brandon is can, just uh... so thrilled with that. Should we have that <laughs> whole conversation again so he can just really enjoy it? No, I'm gonna get fired. Um, <laughs> let's talk actual Nebraska football because, like like I said, so we did this thing this week where where we seated. Um, and I asked you guys to to help me rank one through sixteen the starting quarterbacks Nebraska has had since Eric Crouch left the program. Um, we cut it at Eric Crouch because the assumption was that if we did it like of the the two thousands, Crouch would win. He would be every, everybody's top pick. Um, this was inspired by Bill Connolly's uh, ESPN column where he ranked the sixty quarterbacks, sixty greatest quarterbacks um, since two thousand. Um, which was an interesting ranking. You should, you should go and look at that. And so we are here today just kind of to talk about <clears throat> your guys' rankings, talk about how the, uh, the tournament has shaken out. We let um, people vote on Hale Varsity's social channels, Twitter and Instagram. Um, and we are, as of recording this, we, are, we have not announced the results of the Final Four, uh, but I think Aaron has the results of the Final Four. Um, so we're close to the championship match. Um, First, I, I want to ask you guys, if we did this exercise for every Nebraska quarterback in program history, would Tommy Frazier be the number one overall seed and would Tommy Frazier win? Anyone feel free to jump in. I was going to take Eric Crouch. So I, I think it's between Tommy and Eric, but it's interesting that you bring up Tommy and you bring up social because I'll just say this really quick and then I'll let Brandon because he's way smarter with all of this than me. Uh, the one thing that I think Eric might get an edge on a little bit is the Heisman, but a lot of people believe that Tommy deserved the Heisman, but it was he interesting did. watching the people who um, didn't read the rules of our bracket and were like, why is Tommy Frazier not on here? But Tommy Armstrong is. And like, that's just amazing because it could not be more clear, but I think people I think Tommy Frazier definitely, if we would have done this with all, is for sure a one seed, and he would definitely be a favorite to upset. I think Eric Crouch would have definitely been up there too, though. Yeah, the rules clearly stated there can only be one Tommy in the bracket, and we chose that show. <laughs> um, I think it's, I think it is Frazier. He's he's the overall number one seed and probably the winner. I think being local uh being a, a nebraska schoolboy legend helps helps crouch in fact i bet that's probably the final is is fraser v crouch but for me um fraser spent so long and it, this is my perception of it but it seemed like a lot of people felt this way um fraser really from the time his career ended until probably tebow like, I feel like most people just defaulted hit to him, even though he didn't win the Heisman as the greatest college quarterback ever, you know, 60 and three, you can point to all the stuff like fine. Eddie George got the Heisman. Um, he would just, be, he, he, he had such a stretch of being like, well, it, the default answer is Tommy Frazier for the entire country that I would expect him to take this. But I do think there's, there's some good competition, um, particularly well, Eric Crouch would be number one. I think Turner Gill, would would do really really well in in a all time Nebraska quarterback bracket, and you know with all of these things you you deal with recency bias to to a pretty good degree. But I still have a tough time seeing anybody taking down Tommy. Yeah, I can't disagree with anything there. And in fact, I was going to mention Turner Gill um, as someone who I just feel like would get a really strong vote. Like, I, I don't I think that Tommy Frazier is your eventual winner. And I think that him being I didn't even think about it that way, but he did spend a long time being the default answer as the best college football quarterback. Um, so that definitely helps him. Um, but I think that Gill would get a lot of strong support from people in a vote like this. It would actually be really interesting if you could break that down by um, I don't want to say age group, but by different generations, because like Brandon said, recency bias does affect different people, but I have a point here, but like, if you were able to like ask people who grew up during a certain time period, who is that quarterback for you? And then go to the next generation and the next generation and ask, I'd be curious who people would pick. And if that would change, you know, Tommy versus Turner versus Eric versus anyone else. 
because we actually got to see that play out between um, we actually got to see that play out between Tommy or who was it that I'm thinking of Joe Gans and um, Adrian uh, Martinez. and Adrian Martinez when you were on Twitter, which I would say trends toward an older individual. And I'm not talking like we're all like ancient here, but I would say more younger individuals like teenagers are on Instagram and Adrian beat was Adrian won on Instagram. He had more votes, not, not significant enough to overtake the, the Twitter vote from Joe, but I do think that's really interesting because I think if you're a little bit younger, you might be going like, I know of Joe Gans. And so I'm just curious how that might break out based on where you put that. And this has been actually really fascinating to watch, like who knows what, because I think for a lot of younger Nebraska fans, all they know of Tommy is what their parents and grandparents have told them. So they may know he's a legend in the sense of what his pa- what parents have told them. But would they would that translate for them or would they say, well, I, I actually know a little bit more about Eric Crouch because of the fact one, he's local or whatever else. It would just be really interesting to see how that breaks down. Well, we can play that. Go about that. We can play that little thought experiment right now. Uh, Brandon, you mentioned Tim Tebow when you were talking about the, the guy who kind of came in and, and took Tommy's mantle of greatest of all time for some people. Did, did he do that for you? Do you? Who do you think is the greatest quarterback of all time? Is it Tommy Frazier in your mind or is it somebody else? Um, I, I honestly haven't ever really thought about it that hard. I mean, I think those are probably the top two in my mind. Um, I, I, I probably default to Frazier though. Maybe that's where, based on where I came from and like, I mean, I wasn't a, really a Nebraska fan there. I was from Nebraska and it was just more, you know, he did what he did at a more formative age for me than, than Tebow did. So Tebow like already had to climb Fraser mountain for me, um, which I think probably leads you to be less willing to say he get, got there. It's, you know, it's, it's Jordan, it's Jordan LeBron, right? Like so much of that can be generational where like, if you watch Jordan and Jordan was amazing when you were 14, um, versus if you watch LeBron and LeBron was amazing when you were 14, it probably determines who you're going to go for there. Yeah. And I was looking, I, I just kind of, I just Googled really quickly, like best college quarterbacks ever. And it's totally like, it's definitely very interesting to see the stories because it's very much open to interpretation. But some of the ones that come up quite frequently is Tim Tebow, um, Vince Young, Cam Newton, uh, Peyton Manning. Okay. I feel Tom very Reed. strongly about Cam Newton. Cam Newton had one good season. Yeah, I feel very I feel strongly f- that he's in the conversation based off of just that one season. Really? Like, oh yeah, like that season so, was so good. But then, but then it gets weird for me because if I say that about him, then I feel like I also have to do, do it for Joe Burrow, um, which is to take nothing away from what Burrow did because it was amazing. Um, and so that's why I almost think to be the greatest college football quarterback ever, you have to have both kind of a combination of statistics and longevity accomplishments over a course of time which is the way to separate that which is a long way of saying that i think you still end up getting back to tebow versus frazier so i had i had this conversation with my brother go ahead i just have to say really quick too i just want to point out and i think you're right greg because i think sometimes people misunderstand greatest college quarterback it's not what they do after college so that's why when you're seeing tom brady's name end up on this list it's not that he wasn't a good quarterback in college but the quarterback that people know now is the nfl tom brady and i think i'm looking at some of these lists that people have and it's like where are you basing them because if, if it's after college they're no, that's not the conversation here so if you're just removing what happened afterward and that's the thing is I think sometimes people start to bring that stuff in is what did they do after the fact? And it's like, well, that's not a part of this. So I apologize, Derek. I'm just saying, I noticed that when looking at some of these like suggestions. No, you're fine. When, when Bill's column came out, um, he has Cam Newton at number two and Joe Burrow at number five. And my brother and I talked about this um, pretty significantly for, for a while. And I had Burrow and Cam both down. I th- I, I'm pretty sure I had, uh, burrow out of the top 10 and cam at like eight or nine just because it's one year it's one year and um with 
to get back to my question with Brandon, my answer would be Tim Tebow because I watched him and Tommy Frazier. I didn't watch like I saw YouTube highlights and I saw the um, VHS tape that my dad would get out and show me every time I talked to him about how good Florida was. He would show me that game. Um, but yeah, so so it, it was definitely interesting to see sort of the, the generational um, differences that Aaron was kind of talking about play out with this. Um, and, and, and even too, when, when I was kind of looking at it with, um, and, and sort of comparing everybody's rankings that I got with my own, I was like, yeah, well, I kind of see like, I'm the youngest person on this team. Um, kind of makes sense. Let's, let's transition to that next, because I have your guys's, your guys's rankings pulled up in front of me. Um, and there were some differences. Um, a guy that Greg had at number one was seated number four. And went out in the second round, I believe. Um, so we'll start with you, Greg. You have Jamal Lord at number one. You have Zach Taylor at number two. Joe Gans at number three. And Taylor Martinez at number four. Talk about your rankings. Defend your rankings. Yeah, it, it was... I, I don't know if I... Like, I guess I was surprised when I saw... Because Taylor was on the one line, right? Um, and then Zach is two, Joe yep. was three, and then Jamal's four. So I basically have Taylor and Jamal flipped. Um, I And I will point out, sorry, I will point out, you're not the only one that did this. Mike Babcock had Jamal Lord as number one. Oh, hey, I'm, okay, I'll take that. Anytime that I'm with Mike, I feel like I don't even need to defend this anymore. I just had a real-life moment right there. Um, so <laughs> Jamal Lord, to me, is a guy who, it, to me, is just really, really underrated Um and I think gets like lost in the shuffle a little bit. And I thought it was to me just like completely surprising that he lost in that second round and that he was taken out by Tommy Armstrong. And it's not that Tommy was a bad quarterback because I also think that we're getting to the point to where, and it's starting to happen now where I think people are appreciating Tommy Armstrong more. Um, and that just might be because of what happened after him. Um, but I was still surprised that he took out Jamal but otherwise, I don't think the ranking w was all that crazy. Um, the the whole Taylor Martinez is is kind of interesting to me too because he could have been easily, and he was overall one, but he could have been one for me. I maybe docked him a little bit more because of the injuries, and we didn't get to see the full thing. Um, but but it was really interesting how that top four broke out. Brandon, you had Taylor Martinez at number one. Zach Taylor at number two, Jamal Lord at number three, Joe Gans at number four. You and Aaron both had Gans at number four. Um, and then the uh, the other four of us that voted, we had Gans at either two or three. Why'd you have him at four? Let's start there. Why is he below Jamal Lord for you? Um, one, I think, um, and, and Mike and I had actually talked about this before we ever, we ever knew we were doing a bracket, just talking about really how good Jamal was. Um, he had to follow Eric Crouch. It was a period of not transition in terms of coaching, which, <laughs> um, what, let's see. Well, half of our final four dealt with the coaching change on their own. Nebraska's been there frequently. Um, he was just, he was a, such a super athlete and, it was a period where Nebraska, as you can see from the record in 2002, so they played in the national title game in 2001, and then 2002 fall all the way to 500 in you know, Nebraska's first such season in 40-some years. Um, but he, he, was, he was such a good option quarterback. You know, you look at his numbers, um, which he pulled together for the initial post, and they don't blow you away, but he was doing a lot of work on that team. Um, he, he just he kind of fell in, in between the cracks a little bit. And I think my rating there for him was a little bit of trying to not correct the historical record, but at least say like, Hey, I think there was more here than people probably remember. And I, I too, like Greg was a little surprised to see him lose to Tommy Armstrong though. I think you can probably chalk that up to just, more people based from where we did the poll on Twitter and Instagram, remember Tommy, Tommy Armstrong than Jamal Lord, who was the oldest quote unquote quarterback we had on the list. Aaron, you were the only one that had Zach Taylor on the top line. 
Why? Yeah. Well, first, I just want to say I agree with Brandon on Jamal Lord. I want to just like where I was in my life with my knowledge of Jamal. It was like he did follow one of the greatest quarterbacks in Nebraska history. And the fact that um, I think at the time people really misunderstood him and really misunderstood what he was capable of. And I think even to this day, his contribution to the program is misunderstood. I, I think people sort of lost him. And when you start to dig into what he was able to do and what could have been, and you start to learn more about what he's up to today and like everything else about him, it's easy to sort of like, like Brandon said, want to like correct history for him because all I knew is my grandma being upset because he wasn't Eric Crouch, (laughs) but he was never going to be Eric Crouch. He was a different quarterback. And I think that was a challenge for people was kind of accepting Jamal Lord for who Jamal Lord was and not for the fact that he wasn't a clone of Eric Crouch. Um, as for Zach Taylor, and this is like, this is why these like rankings are always so interesting because this is purely like purely subjective on my part, but Mm -hmm. I like Zach Taylor was the quarterback when I was in college that took a team that should not have really been anything and made them something. He was definitely not who Bill Callahan thought was going to be his quarterback. And yet he was Derek wrote this in the case for him of why, you know, he deserves to be like win this final four. Um, Cause he broke, by the way, Derek broke all of them down, not just Zach Taylor. It's not like he wrote me like my ode to Zach Taylor, why he deserves this piece. Um, but it's hard for me to get past that because he feels like to me, one of the greatest quarterbacks of the last 20 years of Nebraska history because of what he was able to do with how little he had Um, in a purely like in a pure uh, selfish way. I'll tell you this all like some people know about this. When I was growing up, my grandpa was this, my grandpa was a massive Nebraska fan in 1995. He bought me a hat and the whole point was quarterbacks that he, that it wasn't every Nebraska, Nebraska quarterback. It was who you felt deserves to be on this hat. You have them sign it. So there are names like Tommy Frazier was the first Scott Frost, Eric Crouch, uh, Brooke Beringer was somebody I wanted to have sign it, but unfortunately never had the opportunity. But after Eric Crouch, the only other person who has signed it to date is Zach Taylor. And <laughs> if this says anything about Zach Taylor, it took me like two or three times to convince him to sign it. Now, the first time I asked him, because I literally went to college at the same time as him. So I was just like, hey, Zach, would you mind signing this? And he's like, no, I'm not going to do that. I would ruin this hat, like not doing that. It took me having to go to an autograph signing to finally talk him into it because he was like, I'm ruining this hat if I do. So he was saying he didn't belong on the hat with those names? No. (laughs) He's like, there's no way my name belongs on a hat with like Scott Frost and Tommy or or Tommy Armstrong, Tommy Frazier and all these people. What's funny in hindsight is I brought this hat up to Scott Frost two years ago when we wrote the uh, fraternity of the quarterback story for Hill Varsity. And Scott looks at me and goes, he's probably one of the ones who deserves to be on there more than any of us now, isn't he? And I'm like, funny oh how the turntables that's for you Derek no one else will get it unless they watch the office (laughs) I I only get it because Derek sends memes so much um, of the office but real quick I also I think Aaron hit something important there um there though because I got when I got here to Nebraska in 2002 Jamal Lord was my quarterback of my college time in the beginning and then I kind of left for a little bit and then came back and Zach Taylor was the quarterback of that time so I do kind of associate both of those guys with my college time as well Um, so I do think that there's something to that it's kind of interesting. Brandon you had your hand raised go for it. Aaron will you commit right now to letting whoever wins this bracket sign your hat of honor if they are not already on there? So who do we have left? We have Zach Taylor, Joe Gans, Taylor Martinez, and Tommy Armstrong. Yes, I would. Out of that four, I would say I've always thought for the record, I've always thought Joe deserved it, but I knew Joe in college. So that was also really weird to be like, Hey, could you (laughs) just strange to me? Um, But I've often felt like Taylor and Tommy both are, are high level quarterbacks for Nebraska and um 
definitely i will say this though brandon for anyone who's listening it's it's something too where as a member of the media i would never ask one of those two to ever sign it while they were a student athlete because that's not appropriate but it's also not something where i've ever thought about it immediately after it would have to be years after the fact and that is actually how some of these hats were signed was like after the fact um but that's the other part is as I've tra- transitioned into my role almost a decade ago, this hat has sort of sat because I'm like, I'm not going to like bring this to practice and be like, Hey, <laughs> but yes, if any of those four, which one has already signed it, but if the other three, any of them, they absolutely deserve it at this point, there's no reason all three of them honestly should sign it. So if anyone wants to let them know now is the time they, the, the people have spoken these individuals deserve to be on this hat. Jamal Lord probably does too, honestly. So <clears throat> the next place that I wanted to go is one of those two guys, Taylor Martinez or Tommy Armstrong Jr. is going to the championship match. And I was really, really hoping that we were going to get this matchup in the final four, Taylor Martinez versus Tommy Armstrong. Um, for anybody that hasn't been following, Taylor was our number one. Taylor Martinez was our number one. Zach Taylor was our number two. Joe Gans, number three. Tommy Armstrong was number five. So like we alluded to earlier, he upset, going to go to upset Jamal Lord in the second round, who was our number four. And it sets up a matchup between two guys who, for me, in my formative years, were synonymous with each other. I didn't it, it, when I when I was putting this together and putting my rankings together, I was thinking about, OK, what did I think of these guys before I came to Nebraska, before I watched these games, before I really kind of sat down and dug in with this? I thought, yeah, kind of this the same guy that took over. And when you look at their numbers, it really bears it out. Tommy Armstrong was 30 and 14 as a starter. Taylor Martinez was 29 and 14 as a starter. Um, They have Tommy Armstrong has 90. Career touchdowns, Taylor Martinez has 87. Tommy Armstrong has 10,600 career yards of offense. Taylor Martinez has 10,233. I think they're one and two in both categories. Um, Nebraska's program record book. These guys are two of the most productive quarterbacks that Nebraska's ever had, just from from a pure production standpoint. Um, And yet one of them was number one in our ranking, and one of them was number five in our ranking. Let's uh, start with Brandon. What, what's the differentiator for you between these two guys? And, and who, who would you select if you were just picking, yeah, this guy wins and moves on? Who are you selecting? Is it, is it Taylor Martinez? The case for Taylor, uh, at least from my perspective, is he took two different teams to a conference championship game in two different conferences. He single-handedly humiliated Kansas State on a Thursday night which was awesome. I I still go back and watch those highlights just because it's like, I can't believe this happened. Um, He had a specific and stated preference for playing against road games. That's in there. Number five, he made Bo Pelini as mad as I've ever seen him, which is, is hard, is hard to do. So that's, that's all of the intangibles for, well, I guess the conference championships is conference championship games is tangible. That's all for him. Like seeing Tommy's numbers really kind of forced me to reevaluate that. And when you think about, so like think about when Mike Riley came in, like this time, 2015, and he's talking about, he's like, yeah, you know, we've never had a guy like Tommy. We, I understand that you all think this is an imperfect fit. He's like, we're kind of intrigued by it. And they did pretty well. Um, as you guys know, this is like my thing now. Uh, so I, I pulled the against the spread numbers for all of the quarterbacks in the final four, just to see. Not, I'm not saying it, it, it doesn't exist in a vacuum. It's just kind of like, well, did the team kind of overperform based on a Vegas line, which is designed to get everything to a coin flip? Um, or did they underperform? Taylor's, Martin, Taylor's record as a starter, 29-14. 2023 and one 0.466 winning percentage against the spread. So you could say, yeah, you know, Nebraska kind of underperformed for the most part based on that, but they got the wins. Like you got to the conference championship games, Tommy Armstrong uh, over the biggest sample size actually has the best against the, against the spread record, 25, 20 and one 
0.554 winning percentage. The one kind of fly in the ointment for me with, with Tommy is the 44 interceptions. Like if, if, if that's even 30, um, which, you know, let's see, he, well, he played, well, he played 44 games. He threw an interception a game. Like if you get it down to just a shade under that 0.88, like I think, and I don't think anybody would have started here when we were starting this bracket, he has a real case for being the best Nebraska quarterback of the decade, though I don't think anybody would say that just thinking about it gut level. Well, this is where I, that's where, that's exactly where I was at when I was looking at his numbers. I was like this, I, because, because I remember vividly my dad watching these games on Saturdays going, Oh God, Tommy threw off his back foot again. He threw another interception. God dang. Um, Vividly. It happened every single Saturday. And I remember that every single Saturday, that was his thing. He was like, Oh, Tommy threw another interception. Um, We didn't include fumbles. Uh, I didn't include fumbles in the, uh, the table, the spreadsheet that I sent you guys. They're just, too weird to track for some whatever reason with with the college football public databases um but like yeah that was the thing 44 interceptions against 67 touchdowns um for tommy armstrong it was just a little too loosey-goosey with the football uh for my liking and and i mean you kind of hit on it when you talked about the conference championships that's the real differentiator between those two guys is taylor got them to those games and tommy has a six and seven record on his ledger um, Greg, those, those big games or the, the turnovers, was that the differentiator for you with, with Tommy and, and with Taylor? Let me look at your, you had, um, oh, well, you had Taylor Martinez at four and Tommy Armstrong at five. Yes. So that was basically the difference for me was that the, the turnovers, um, from Tommy Armstrong, um, was the big thing because it, it is, it's funny what I kind of, when I first sat down to kind of do the ranking, did the rankings before, like really diving into the numbers and then come back and like kind of reslot them. My gut reaction was actually remembering what you were saying about your dad watching them every Saturday, which is I can just remember all of the times it feels like Tommy Armstrong threw off his back foot and it was some sort of ill-advised pass or a YOLO bomb or something or, or another with Tommy Armstrong. But then you sit down and you look at it and you're like, well, wait a second. Like, if you just look at the numbers, like in their totality, you had a great career. Like, and I think, and that's what I said earlier in the pod, that I feel like the more time we get away from Tommy Armstrong, because Tommy Armstrong was also maybe as polarizing by the time he got done um, as anyone on this list. Because by the time we got done with him, like people were just ready to push him to the side um, and be done with it. But now that you've had time to step back and and look at it with, with a different perspective, you're like, well, huh, he's actually pretty good, especially considering he was in that big uh, coaching transition with Mike Riley. Like, there's a lot more there than you realize. But also, for me, the separator is that Taylor Martinez, at his best, because of how great of an athlete he was, and I think as good as um, anyone on the list, like right there with Jamal Lord in terms of just overall athleticism. So I also think that that was a, a big-time separator as well. There's also the what if factor, right? Like what if Taylor's foot is fine and yeah. he gets to play his senior season? Um, that's probably one of the big what ifs with Nebraska football all time. Um, Aaron, you had him at uh, you, Tommy Armstrong. I should say you had Tommy at, at number seven behind mm-hmm. Joe Daly um, and Adrian Martinez kind of explain sort of your, your thought process and the evaluation that you did there. Uh, I don't know. I, <sighs> He probably, he should have been higher. Um, the, the thing that I felt like after I got honestly past the top four for myself was everything was just so like almost coin flip for me where I could make a case any which way for why somebody deserves to be where they are. Um, I probably should have put him ahead of Adrian. I still think Joe Daly deserves to be ahead of him. I think Joe Daly is another one where he doesn't probably get as much credit. And so maybe it's just my own personal um, bias interfering where I want to like correct history to a degree. And I totally accept that if that's what my brain is doing. Um, But I think the thing with, I just want to start really quick with both Taylor and Tommy is something that I thought was really like a lot of people made fun of Taylor for being dumb. And I think it's probably important to say that like 
Taylor's personality was very fun loving. Like he was just like kind of, I, I think the reason people always felt like he uh, wasn't f- like he wasn't fully there is because he easily brushed things off and moved on to the next. So he gets absolutely berated by Bo Pelini and people were like, oh, look, he's got rocks in his head because he doesn't even care. And it's like, no, he just, I think, knew how to like move on from things very quickly and didn't seem to sit on them or dwell. And that was in a lot of ways, a huge benefit to him. So you start to think like if he hadn't gotten injured, what could he have done? Because he was somebody who could just let so much roll off of his back. So the potential was so significant where I probably, um, Tommy just felt like, I think, and this was what was so different between them is Tommy felt like a professional from day one. He was just like almost, he was very different than Taylor in personality. He was very cool, calm, collected. So when you go from Taylor, who's kind of like, and I say this in the most loving way, a space cadet, like he's just kind of like doing whatever he's just living Taylor Martinez's life and just, you know, being who he is, which is not a bad thing at all to have Taylor, to have Tommy, who is so much more serious. I think some people saw that and viewed Tommy as like, well, he takes the game more seriously. Like he, he feels more strongly about this. He's going to learn the playbook and understand it better than Taylor. I actually think that they were a lot alike and they just had a diff. They had just had different personalities. They just approached things differently. They approached how they handled things differently. But if you go and ask a player like Kenny Bell, who played with both of them, what do you think about them? He has a ton of respect and appreciation for both of those players. Did they have issues, you know, adjusting to one another between Taylor to Tommy? Sure. But you go from being a wide receiver who is playing with one quarterback to now transitioning to a different quarterback there's going to be growing pains. I probably, I probably underrated Tommy in my rankings. I probably should have put him higher. He should have been higher than Adrian. But I think when I got to some of those rankings, I was just like, I could make the case for really where any of these players are at and feel okay about it. Because I think Adrian has also done a really nice job for Nebraska, despite he kind of feels like one who could potentially 10 years down the road, people have a different understanding of the type of quarterback he was. And I think that's the hard part is we said that with Tommy, people are going to feel differently about Tommy five, 10 years in the future. And we're starting to see that because if we had done this poll six years ago, people would not be voting for Tommy in the way that they are right now, because I don't think people felt he was as good as he is. And I think when time separates something, you can kind of look at it a little bit more objectively and you can kind of see something. So I may be overrating Adrian or I might be underrating him. Who knows? Like, it seems like he's still at a point where it's hard to know what I did, what I did or did not do with him (laughs) in this like rating. But Tommy and Taylor are so interesting where I almost wish they could have been the final two because that would have been kind of fun to see what people would have done. But I think Tommy wouldn't be Tommy without Taylor. And I think Taylor was pushed because of Tommy. I think the two of them almost bettered one another in a way. So it's, it's so hard that like these two ended up against each other because long story short, I think both of them are pretty solid quarterbacks for Nebraska at a time. And I think so much could have been different if like an injury didn't happen, a coaching change didn't happen. This didn't happen. Like imagine all the what ifs, if things had just been a little bit different for these two. I'm glad you brought up Adrian because that's where I wanted to go next. Um, Jacob, who is, who is not on this podcast. Um, you put him he, one. I'm just kidding. No, he, he had Adrian <laughs> fourth. Um, okay. <laughs> and, and like, Jacob, I mean, Jacob is as, as purely analytical and, and able to remove emotion and, and narrative from, from a conversation as any of us. He has Adrian fourth. Um, I had Adrian fifth, Greg and Mike and Brandon had him sixth. Aaron, you had him fifth. Um, so in our, in our kind of cumulative ranking, he was sixth. If you look at just sort of the production that Adrian has had, um, with a season or maybe two still left to play, he uh, is third amongst all of these guys in in total offense produced, third in touchdowns, um, and he's right there with with Joe Gans in in terms of highest completion percentage for his career. He's at sixty four point two percent. I'm going to throw out Luke McCaffrey's sixty four point eight percent and say that Adrian Martinez is second behind Joe Gans on this list. Um, so from a numbers standpoint, Adrian is producing right up there with the best of them. What happens this season, this upcoming season, 
will probably largely shape um, the the legacy of Adrian Martinez as Nebraska's quarterback. If he has a decent season, let's say he throws for 2,500 yards or something like that, or puts up you know 2,500 yards of total offense um, and gets close to Taylor and close to Tommy in terms of production, does he rise up your guys' rankings? What does he have to do to rise up the rankings? Greg. Oh, Aaron wants to go first. No, I – just one little quick thing. And then Greg, by all means, I think for me, what Adrian sort of encapsulates with this whole conversation, and this doesn't necessarily answer your question, but I think it's kind of like an asterisk to it is so many of these quarterbacks, when you ask about the what ifs, the what ifs are there because they need help on the team outside of themselves to be successful. So I think a lot of what is going to determine the future of Adrian Martinez is what happens around him. Does he have the receivers he needs to actually be able to run this offense, the running backs, does the offensive line hold up because, and this is why I put him where I did. Zach Taylor did a lot with a little, not everyone can do what Zach Taylor did. And what Zach Taylor did was in a very different ball game. We're talking now 14 years, like what, even more than that, 15, 16 years ago now it's a different ball game today and they're in a totally different league expecting a quarterback to do everything is that's kind of like f- capturing lightning in a bottle to have a quarterback who can like basically play without anyone else helping him. So for me, a lot of Adrian is based on what's happening around him. Now that's not your question. Cause you're asking about Adrian himself, but I just, I think for myself, when I look at all of these players, I wonder if things had been a little bit different around them. If you could take a quarterback and put them into a different system or into a different time period, what they would have looked like with a different team. But you can't do that because they are fundamentally fundamentally tied to whatever team that they were with. So it doesn't really matter. But that's kind of where I am with Adrian is what does this team look like in 2021? Because he's very tied to it. Which is exactly, and that actually leads me perfectly into what I was going to say. So good job, Aaron. Uh, The team has to be better. Like, I think that when you end up, like, because if he, even if if Adrian just slightly improves the statistical pace that he's on and say he gets in the the conversation where he's within shouting distance with Taylor and Tommy um, in the record books, or let's say he even surpasses them by a little bit. The difference will be, well, but he didn't really win anything like that. Like, especially if let's say they don't go to a bowl game again this year, like it's a, it's just not a great spot for him to be in to then have people throw praise on him as his kind of individual brilliance, because those losses were also coming in which his play was kind of up and down. It would be different if he was just like off the charts, great, but the team was still losing, then that would be a different ball game. But I think that the situation they find themselves in, he has to improve some, but then the team also has to win for him to really start vaulting up this list because that will end up being the big separator between these other, what, five guys that we had rated ahead of him. There are three guys who have started a game for Nebraska since Adrian Martinez started his first game. And in those games, Nebraska is 0-3, 1-4. 1-4. and Put any stock into that, Brandon? Yeah, I think there's 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 something to that. Um, Aaron's comment about, you know, that's the that's the hard part about this, even like with some of the numbers that I went and pulled, it's like okay, this is what happened when they were quarterback, but how much of it is because of them? Um, so I do think that bolsters Adrian's case a little bit that, well, when he doesn't play, um, I mean, I don't remember what his career record is off the top of my head. It's a, you know, a losing record because Nebraska (laughs) hasn't had a winning record. 11 and 16, 11 and 16. Okay. So yeah, you're about 500 or well, you're a little bit short of 500 there. Um, yeah, I think, I think that's part of it. Um, you know, and we don't really have the quarterback. I mean, maybe Armstrong is the best quarterback where you're just like, based on where we thought he was, you know, the fact that none of us really kind of put him in Taylor Martinez's category before seeing the stats and be like, Oh, they're virtually identical um, is a little bit of indicator indication of Nebraska's overall talent level. I think coming out of the Bo Pelini era, which was different than its talent level entering the Bo Pelini era. Um, so, so there is some of that, but I think ultimately it boils, it boils down to that. Like you need, you need the results, um, in the win loss column to, to really be in the conversation. 
But if we'd had this, if we had done this bracket in March of 2019, Adrian might've won it because that's how high the enthusiasm level around him was after his true freshman season. Yeah. That's a really good point. Um, we have Taylor versus Tommy one five. I think I voted for Tommy in that we have, uh, Zach versus Joe in the two, three. I voted for Joe in that. And I think Zach won. Um, so I think we're getting a, a Taylor, a, a one versus two final, a, a Taylor Martinez versus Zach Taylor final. Who wins this guys? Who, who wins it for you, Aaron? Zach Taylor. And it okay. seems like a lot of people are on my side with this because his votes are very strong. It what's okay. So what's really interesting to me is to kind of dissect what people do and don't say on social media with a lot of this stuff. And I just want to point out through all of this, people have left comments about Tommy, about Taylor, about Adrian, about Joe, um, about this person, this person, the one person who has consistently gotten more votes than anyone else across the board since we started this, but has not received pretty much any comments is Zach Taylor. And it feels like so many people are voting for him because it's like, well, he's obvious. That's the obvious choice, but they don't have anything else to say beyond it. And I find that really fascinating because the other quarterbacks have created so much conversation, but the person who keeps winning is the one that I'm, I'm really not exaggerating when I say this, not a single person on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter has really brought anything up about him. They just vote for him and go on and then start talking about Taylor Martinez. It's interesting to me. So I'll be curious to see what the conversation looks like with Taylor and if people start saying anything more about him and their thoughts because so far. So it feels like it's just he is who he is, and there's nothing more for people to say. They just vote for him and move on. It, it is interesting, um, the, the kind of like Zach Taylor, 17-9 and nine as a starter. He threw 45 touchdowns against 20 interceptions. Um, they were 8-4 and four and then 9-5, and five, and he led them to a Big 12 championship. Um, championship game, I should say. Big 12 Offensive Player of the Year. Like, then you go to Taylor, and, and people can kind of, well, he had this, or well, he had that, or well, he did this, or or while well, there was this and with Zach Taylor, it seems like there's just a lot of, yeah, he was really good. He was really good. Um, Greg, who wins it for you or who should win? Maybe that's the better question. Who should have won it? You think Jamal Lord should have won it? Uh, well, yeah, I think Jamal Lord should have won it just that I had him number one. I think that Zach Taylor should win it. Um, but I do find that fascinating about the lack of comments about him, but it also made me think of is, is that because like the, these other guys that we're talking about here recently, whether it's Taylor, Tommy, Adrian, in the most recent discussion, seem to end up being like just lightning rods afterwards, like or even during their playing career? Is there something to that? Because I do wonder why it is exactly that Zach Taylor did not become that um, beyond the fact that he was just really good. And that's what people think of him as is just being really good. Uh, but ultimately, I think that he's your winner and should be the winner. Is it because people feel like they have to explain away the other quarterbacks? That would might be another piece of it is do people feel like they have to add the caveat of, well, if it was like this, it would be this. Whereas with Zach Taylor, it just is. Maybe. That could be part of it. Brandon, are you going to make it a clean sweep and say that uh, Zach Taylor should be the winner? No. Do you want to know my pick in that matchup or do you want to know who I think I would have who I would have picked to win if it had gone all the way through. I would like both. Okay. Um, I think we only need about five more hours on this podcast to like, actually like it, it seriously is fascinating to me because, so we talked a lot about Taylor and, and Tommy and because he's not here, I want to give special credit to Jacob for this. Cause for me, he like boiled that entire thing down into one line. He, he said, I think Taylor just had more punch than Tommy, more upside, similar downside. And for me, I was like, yeah, that's pretty much, that's pretty much it. Um, Taylor's interesting. So he wins big 12 offensive player of the year. Zach Taylor is interesting. Wins that award in 2006. In 2007, the big 12 starts to go nuts from a offensive football standpoint. This is Kansas. This is the Missouri year. Um, Texas Tech has always been over there doing what they're doing. Oklahoma is doing what they're doing, but they're getting even more, you know, powerful. It, it's just it's it's interesting that Zach Taylor 
by kind of being a really good West Coast quarterback was the winner of the offensive player of the year in that conference at that time, um, which is which is a feather in his cap. That said, um, as, as Greg mentioned a while ago with Cam Newton, you know, for me, longevity plays into it. Um, and Zach Taylor, he only played two seasons. That's all he could have played. He went to a Big 12 championship game, too. So he was one for two. Taylor was two for four, knowing we didn't get a, he didn't get to play his his fourth season. I think ultimately for me, Taylor was in a little bit of a tougher situation. He, be, he won that job in 2010 because it's where Nebraska wanted to go as an offense. And he obviously was very individually talented and he just had that ability. I, I still, I watch a lot of college football and I still don't know if I've seen many players who are get up to full speed within three steps more quickly than Taylor was able to. Like it was just, it was, it was truly a gift. It wasn't perfect. It was a little bit maddening. As I mentioned, he had the worst against the spread record of any of these four guys, um, which carries a little bit of weight for me, but his, his QB, he had the best QBR for whatever you think about that stat. Um, I at least always look at it as kind of a basic check or baseline his 2012 season, so the last time Nebraska played for a conference championship game, he ranked 12th nationally. He was 24th as a freshman, dropped to 50th in, in 2011 as he was dealing with the turf toe injury that would eventually end his his career too early. So it's a it's a close race. I think just individual talent, I would probably probably take Taylor Martinez if I were choosing a quarterback for Nebraska right now. Um, I would take Zach Taylor among those two, but the one I would choose right now for Nebraska, given any option is probably Joe Gans, which might be my ultimate pick to win the, it's a tough argument to make because the sample size is so small, just 16 games as, as a starter. But when we look back at the Bo Pelini era, I think, um, having a player like Joe Allman steady and it put in the work really got the Bo Pelini era off to a start that it it wouldn't have it wouldn't have otherwise well that's going to do it for this week uh, you guys probably have stuff to to get back to and get on with your day so thank you for coming on this podcast and thank you for talking about quarterbacks um it was uh it was fun it was informative for me to listen to you guys that actually lived those years talk about them so thank you for coming on thank you thank you for having me Aaron refuses to say anything. We will be back next week with another podcast. She's oh, playing Zach with her, Taylor. Playing, <laughs> playing with her Funko Pops. Um, we will be back next week with another podcast. In the meantime, keep reading HailVarsity.com. Listen to Aaron and Sasha's Mind Your Own podcast uh, that comes out every week. Listen to Greg and Jay's Straight Up Breakdown podcast that comes out every week. Subscribe to those. Um, and make sure that you vote the championship round on Hail Varsity's Twitter and Instagram pages. Talk to you guys next week. A Huda Media Production.